La facciamo benissimo. Paola. E non abbiamo bisogno di nessuno. Luca Capuano and Salvatore Scarpa are a couple living in a small town in southern Italy. They have two horses and a chihuahua. They've been together ever since they met in 2016. And they recently had a baby girl named Paola. Oh. Oh. They are very doting dads, um, <laughs> almost to the point of obsession with their daughter. Anthony Fiola is the Rome bureau chief for The Post. Earlier this year, he spent the day with Luca, Salvatore, and Paola in their home. It's very cute to see the way in which they fawn over her and um, spend every waking minute um, trying to tend to her rather ample needs. You know, they make her gourmet mush um, of rabbit and fennel, which is a very traditional Southern Italian mixture. Um, Sal likes to do little dances to keep her happy. (laughs) Which isn't a very difficult thing to do because she is a very happy baby. (laughs) Their point that they made repeatedly was that they're able to give a child that kind of uh, lifestyle, which in many ways, you know, exceeds the average in Southern Italy. But, you know, despite all of that privilege, she still remains a legal orphan. In the spring of 2023, Italy's right-wing government made it impossible for same-sex parents to register birth certificates for their children. This was just a few months before Paola was born, and it's why she is still a legal orphan. It's one of many obstacles for same-sex couples in Italy who want to have kids. Gay marriage is still illegal, adoption is nearly impossible, and domestic surrogacy is banned outright. So that has left couples like Luca and Salvatore with one option, international surrogacy. And that's what they did. Paola was born in California with the help of an American surrogate. But in the coming months, the Italian parliament is expected to pass new legislation that would ban international surrogacy altogether. It's just one piece of an effort by conservatives in both Europe and the U.S. to try to reshape what families look like. Right now, governments around the world are considering questions around reproductive rights. France just enshrined abortion rights in its constitution, and a debate over IVF in Alabama has forced patients to reconsider their plans. Luca and Salvatore are going through their own version of this struggle, and they're now at a crossroads. Luca and Sal, they encapsulate what activists in Italy have called a a war on same-sex parenthood, perhaps better than any other couple um, that we had contact with. And the reason was, not only do they have a newborn daughter who's seven months old, who they're currently having great difficulty um, legalizing within the country, but in addition, they have an embryo ready to go for their second child. Um, And they're racing against the clock to see whether or not they might be able to move forward with a second surrogacy before a new law is passed in Italy that would actually criminalize the process. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers, and it's Monday, March 18th. Today, the story of one same-sex couple trying to build a family in a country where that is becoming nearly impossible. Anthony Fiola spoke with my co-host, Alahe Azadi. Anthony, I want to go back to this couple, Luca and Salvatore, and how did they come to this decision that they wanted to start a family together? So it's interesting. Um, Luca Capuano, who's the older member of the couple, he grew up in a generation of Italian men who perhaps um, wanted to be fathers, but didn't necessarily see an open route to doing it because of the existing prejudice that they grew up with uh, in their generation. I have had the same passions for babies since I was uh, young, but I stopped the idea when I 
was in peace with myself that I was gay. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if it's not possible, probably my life is not to be a father. Mm -hmm. uh, not that Salvatore Scarpa, who is the younger member of the group, didn't also experience um, prejudice when he was growing up. No. Salvatore doesn't speak English, and so my colleague Stefano Petrelli, uh, who works in our Rome bureau, was helping me translate. So what has been difficult at school during the during adolescence? Era più accentuato perché avendo le movenze un po' più femminili, ballavo e quindi sì. But he also comes from a generation that sort of claimed its rights more, let's say, just as happened in the United States. Um, and because of that, he had very clear eyes about um, his right and desire to be a father. And together, they came to the realization that, yes, they deserve to be parents. Um, and, you know, they made the ultimate decision to pursue it, knowing the great hurdles that they were going to face in doing so. And so, how did Luca and Sal go about having a baby? Yeah, I mean, they initially tried adoption. Um, and they quickly found out that the legal obstacles to adoption in Italy are pretty complete and that even international adoption um, didn't seem like an option given the fact that there were many, many barriers that they were facing. Um, so the, ultimately they decided to go the route of surrogacy. Why is it that it's difficult to have a surrogate in Italy? So surrogacy, domestic surrogacy in Italy is banned by law. And, you know, Italy is not the only country in Europe where that's true. There is a more uh, skeptical, a more conservative approach to the issue of surrogacy taken in Europe than in the United States. Um, it's an exception um, because in many other ways, European countries tend to be more socially liberal um, than the U.S., but not in that regard. Now, uh, often surrogacy for European couples that are seeking it overseas will be done in either Ukraine, which is no longer the option that it once was for obvious reasons, um, or the United States. So Luca and Sal turned to a reproductive clinic in California, and um, through that clinic, they were able to source Ashley May, the woman who would ultimately become the surrogate mother to Paola. My husband and I have two kids. We were done. We're happy with two. While I was with Luca and Sal, uh, they were talking to Ashley May, and I asked her about why she decided to do this. Um, so I started talking to him, and I was like, would you be, like, okay if I were to want to be a surrogate? Because my delivery or, like, my pregnancies were... I didn't have any complications. I didn't have any delivery complications. I just felt like if I could give somebody that gift, it would be amazing. So She I says she made this choice uh, out of a wish to give a family to people who had no other option of doing it. She doesn't appear to be doing it for the money. Her and her husband both have good jobs, and her husband has supported her in this process. They live a good life in suburban Southern California. Um, and... You know, she had an immediate connection, the way that she tells it, um, with Luca and Sal. They hit it off immediately. It's crazy. I feel like, I don't know, we've been connected forever, and I've only known them, what, a little over a year, maybe a year and a half? I don't even know when we first met, but since day one, I've loved them. <laughs> wow. Ashley, Salvatore. Oh. As always, <laughs> he's crying. <laughs> and they've gotten so close that Ashley has actually agreed to carry their second baby for them. I would, I didn't even have to think about it. I was like, yes, I'm in. Wow. I'm ready to go. Let's do it. And I was surprised. I was like, dang, they're already ready for a second one. They're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it that you think that there is so much um, opposition to surrogacy in some places? I mean, why why do you think that sentiment exists? 
Honestly, I have no idea. I think people just get so stuck in their ways. Somebody mentioned something to me when they first found out I was going to be a surrogate. They said, well, if God wanted them to have a baby, then they would be able to have a baby. And I was like, what? That's... It just blew my mind that somebody could be so cold-hearted and... If they can love that child as their own, why not allow them to be the amazing parents that they are intended to be? After the break, why Italy is now considering an all-out ban on surrogacy, and what that could mean for the future of Luca and Salvatore's family. We'll be right back. So, Anthony, I want to know why Luca and Sal and other couples like them have found themselves in these situations. I I know gay marriage isn't legal in Italy. Couples can have civil unions, but not being able to get legally married means they can't adopt children. So what are some of the other laws and proposals that have made it difficult for same-sex couples to have children? So there's two main elements here. Um, One element is a government edict that went out last year that informed mayors in Italian cities and towns that they could not register children that had birth certificates with same-sex parents. The government has argued that it was responding to a legal ruling, but activists have said that they actually overstretched and leveraged that ruling in order to uh, enforce a policy decision that would create a new hurdle to same-sex parenthood. The second element is a law that has already been passed in the lower house of the Italian parliament and will come up for a vote in the Senate likely in the coming months and would place a ban on international surrogacy and in fact criminalize it with up to two years in prison and a one million euro fine for those found guilty of using the practice of surrogacy overseas. So the passage of that law would effectively bar most, if any, route available to same-sex couples having children. And Anthony, when it comes to surrogacy, where is the opposition to that coming from? The opposition to surrogacy lies mostly in the argument that it is a potential, the potential to exploit women. And that argument is essentially that it's rent a womb, right? And that it is not um, according to the natural law, that the potential to exploit women Um, who are doing this purely out of financial need is uh, so potentially high that the practice should be banned. And additionally, you know, we had Pope Francis recently um, call for an international ban on surrogacy using some of the same words and some of the same arguments that we saw Prime Minister Maloney in Italy using uh, to defend uh, the ban on surrogacy uh, that they would like to impose. You have the strong influence of the Vatican here in Italy um, that has weighed on social policy for years. And what is the government's argument here? What do they have to say to critics of the proposed ban on surrogacy? The government will say, and the government argues strongly, that this is not targeting same-sex parents. They will say that this is you know, uh, a universal measure, that they have, you know, they're not out to um, to halt gay rights um, or roll them back. But at the same time, you have activists that look at their actual actions, that that, that is indication that in fact, behind the scenes, they are trying to target gay rights without actually being blatant in saying it. Mm. You know, Anthony, I, I do want to return back to why this is happening? And maybe can you explain some of the politics of Italy around not just surrogacy, but more broadly LGBTQ rights? Because my impression of Europe uh, as an American is that um, in, in many respects, they are a more, it's a more secular society than the United States. They're more socially liberal. They're, and so it's kind of surprising to hear that maybe that's not the case when it comes to comes to this. So can you tell me more about about the Prime Minister of Italy and and some of the internal politics there right now? 
So Italy today has its most right-wing government since World War II. Um, and it is headed by Giorgia Maloney, who has taken an unsurprisingly conservative stance on family rights. Um, you know, she's been pushing measures that activists are essentially calling, you know, tantamount to a war on same-sex parenthood. Um, she is an interesting example of a hard right leader in the sense that she has been accepted in the halls of Washington and Brussels. And she's been accepted because she has not explored sort of these more authoritarian tendencies that we've seen come out of, you know, for instance, the leaders of Hungary and the previous rulers of Poland. Um, and in addition, she has taken a hard line on Russia and staunchly supported Ukraine. So her foreign policy in, in many ways has led her to be accepted internationally um, in ways that uh, other hard-right leaders in Europe have not really managed to do. But domestically, she has pursued um, a very conservative agenda. We've seen a ton of progress in Europe um, when it comes to to gay rights. And in addition, you know, Europe is the cradle of gay marriage, right? The Netherlands um, was the first country to adopt it in 2001. But just as in the United States, I mean, we've seen a backlash in Europe as progress has grown. Now, that's mostly been in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, in Poland, you know, some cities and towns had declared, you know, LGBTQ free zones. In Hungary, they passed a law banning um, so-called, you know, gay propaganda to protect youth, which has led to books being removed from store shelves and the firing of a museum director. Um, we also saw an effort that was just barely stopped in Hungary last year and that would have encouraged people to turn in gay couples that they suspected of having children to authorities. And so, you know, what we've seen coming out of the Italian government, you know, is in some ways more focused than that. Um, you know, they have, rather than sort of go off uh, on a broad spectrum of gay rights, they have instead sort of laser focus on the issue of same-sex parenthood. And one thing I'm wondering is that a ban on surrogacy would impact many parents, not just same-sex couples, right? So why is there a fear that a ban on surrogacy would target same-sex parents in a way that it would in others? So the reason why is because um, it is widely recognized that it's going to be difficult, um, if not impossible, to enforce an international ban on surrogacy on heterosexual couples. Um, even the government admits the difficulty in doing so because a couple of the opposite sex can return from the United States or Greece or wherever um, and make the argument that uh, the wife and the couple simply gave birth overseas, right? You will, and they will have no problem registering that birth certificate at a town hall in Italy because they have parents of the opposite sex on the birth oh. certificate. So the, the, it's possible that the question will never be asked of that couple whether or not surrogacy was involved in the birth of their child. Meanwhile, if you have particularly two men who return from overseas with a child and you have a birth certificate that has both of their names on it, it's obvious that they've just undergone international surrogacy. There's almost no other way they could have gotten that child um, as an infant unless it's adoption, which is also illegal in Italy. So in that sense, it is going to be far easier to catch those violators who are same-sex parents than those who are heterosexual couples. So it's like heterosexual couples can fly under the radar in a way that same-sex couples can't, especially if it's two men. Absolutely. That, that's exactly it. What would be the the ramifications more broadly if this law were to pass in Italy? What does that mean for other people? So, you know, there's a couple of things here. First of all, a lot of legal scholars will argue that it's still not clear how the law will be enforced, right? Because there's going to be a great complexity. Is it enforced at the border? Is it enforced at the point in which a couple tries to register their child in, in their home district? Um, and in that case, 
you know, will a small town in Italy really have the legal resources available to them to pursue a case um, if there's a surrogate in California that might have given birth to a child? So, you know, the extent to which this is being done for actual legal practice or the extent that it's being done for political theater remains in question. But either way, it will have, um, according to the families that we spoke with and the families and the activists that we spoke with, that it will have a deterrent effect um, on same-sex couples in particular trying to pursue international surrogacy as an option to start families. And I think... You know, it will lead couples like Luca and Sal to reconsider whether or not living in Italy remains the best practice for them. They are facing the possibility that they could be outlaws if they continue with their second surrogacy, given the fact that it is almost a near certainty that that child will be born after the approval of this law. Uh, we start looking for a, an apartment in France because Salvatore speaks French, lived in French for seven years. So, so probably the, the, uh, the easy idea is to move to France. They are looking at real estate in France. And given the fact that Paola is an American citizen, um, they may also have a legal pathway to relocating to the United States. So they're thinking um, about both those avenues. Neither one of them uh, is attractive to the couple. They would much prefer to stay at home where they have family support, where you know they live in a place which, which they love dearly uh, and they have long roots in. Uh, and you know, uprooting at this stage in their life, I think would be a very difficult thing for them to do, but they've made clear that their family would come first. Um, you know, going forward, their family is more important than their country. They've made that quite clear. So I know that you had mentioned the ban on international surrogacy, that this has gone through the lower house of the Italian parliament already. And the final vote is coming up sometime in the coming months. So, Anthony, just stepping back, I wanted to ask, what why was it important for you to cover this story at this moment? And what will you be focusing on in the coming months? I mean, it feels important to capture this moment uh, in... European politics in the sense that you do have a new crop of harder right leaders uh, coming to power or becoming members of government in places where they haven't really been taken seriously um, for many decades. Um, and this sort of broader stance that we've seen uh, in several countries where the, where the harder right holds sway um, on LGBTQ issues is something that, you know, it's, it's an issue that I think becomes something of a bellwether for how they're going to be handling other policies as well, abortion, um, how they're going to be handling other issues re relating to women's reproductive rights, um, how they're going to be handling, you know, issues related to education. Um, and, you know, and I think all of these collectively taken at this moment, it's important for us to capture that. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for sharing the story with us. Thank you. Anthony Fiola is the Rome bureau chief for The Post. He spoke with my colleague, Alahe Azadi. Before we go, here is one more story that we are following today. It looks like former President Trump cannot come up with the more than $450 million that he's been ordered to pay by a judge. The money that Trump owes was part of the business fraud case in New York. The New York Attorney General had said that Trump misstated the value of his assets by up to $2.2 billion for over a decade. Trump, his company, and several current and former employees were found liable this year for lying about the real value of Trump's assets. Because of that, he has to pay a significant financial penalty. But today, his lawyers said in a court filing that they have not been able to come up with the cash because they can't find any company to accept real estate as collateral. The bond is due in a week. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. Today's show was produced by Peter Bresnan. 
It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Lucy Perkins. Thank you to Stefano Petrelli and Marisa Bellock. If you love the show, help other people discover it by leaving a rating on Spotify or a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Martine Powers. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post.